PowerPoint and, uh, and uh, proceed with it uh, if I can find it. That, that doesn't look like the right screen. We will try. Ah, yes. Okay, it is the right screen. We are at the point of, of asking a question that arose in 1987. Didn't Jesus give up his humanity at the ascension? Um, people who came to our conference in um, Nagar Coil back in 1987 were convinced that he was, he was God, but he was, he was man only temporarily uh, so that he was, he was a human only as long as he was on the earth. But when he ascended, he gave up his uh, human nature. What, we want, what I want to do in the next few slides is to address this issue. Did he give up his humanity in the ascension? And the, the beginning point must be 1 Timothy 2.5. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. My question must be, what is this role of mediation that Jesus has, and how does it take place? Um, ha. Oh, I am back in seeing you, and you don't want to see me any more than you must. So I'm um, going to go back to PowerPoint. Um, and uh, we'll then, oh, fish feathers. Okay, now we're back. Um, First Timothy 2.5, his mediatorial work, we'll say it a little bit more as we go, uh, but his mediator, mediatorial work, it didn't happen on earth precisely. It happens at the right hand of God. So the one who is at the right hand of God, the mediator, is the man Christ Jesus. And we may go farther and say, um, Acts 111, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And that's, uh, uh, that's a fairly significant statement. Good grief, I'm having trouble with controlling my screen. Um, that's a fairly significant statement we, we may have occasion to say this again before we're through this morning, this evening for you, uh, but um, in the same way can refer to the method of his departure, namely by a cloud, or it can be, it, it, in fact, in, in Greek, it's ambivalent. It, in English, it's not in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. That suggests by way of the cloud, but in, in Greek, it is, he will come just as you saw him go into heaven. Well, but how did you see him go into heaven? You saw him go physically as a man. And so you will see him again in the same fashion as you have seen him before. But Hebrews chapters 5, 7, and 8 each have significant affirmations about the humanity of Jesus in his present work of high priestly ministry. So in 5.1, uh, in every high priest, and we're, we're setting up in verses 1 to 5 here of chapter 5, the basics of, of what high priesthood is. Every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God. That's verse 1. Verse 2, he can deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward, since he himself is beset with, with weakness. And then I have in verse 6, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. But he's chosen from among men. A priest must be chosen from among men. This is what the Holy Spirit inspired the author of Hebrews to write. If this is true, and he is a priest forever, he must be a man forever, or he is not a priest any longer. Uh, furthermore, in chapter 5, verse 9, being made perfect, he became the source of eternal, to all, of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being made perfect is difficult in itself, 
we would assure, we would assure ourselves that Jesus was perfect in himself. But this, this word made perfect in Greek is the word that's used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament to translate um, what we would call ordination. So I would argue here, the point of this is not that he was not perfect and then became perfect, nor that he was immature and became mature. It is that he, is, he has been perfected, ordained by way of suffering. His ordination to his priesthood was his suffering. That was the element of his weakness. I, I want you to remember uh, in the previous slide that the priest is chosen because he is beset, beset by weakness. Jesus, with strong cryings and tears, pleaded with him, offered his petitions to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his godliness. So he is ordained as a weak man to be able to deal with weak humanity. If he no longer has, the, has any sense of human weakness in himself, then he is not a high priest. And he goes on in chapter 7, verse 11. Now, if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, and this word perfection again shows up, fulfillment perhaps in this case, if fulfillment had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? Now, we've talked about Melchizedek in recent sessions, and I want to reaffirm to you, Melchizedek is not a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. Melchizedek is a true human being, and I know this because Hebrews says he was made like the Son of God. He is not the Son of God, or he could not be like him. He would be the Son of God. So he is made like the Son of God, and that like, which is representing something specific in Greek, I won't go into the details of that, but there is a specific reference to the similarity, not the like, not the identity. So he is similar to the Son of God, but Melchizedek is a man. So to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek, he must be a man. That was what Hebrews told us. That's what the Holy Spirit inspired the author of Hebrews to tell us. In chapter 5, a priest is chosen from among men, but his Melchizedek and priesthood cannot function on the earth. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest, not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but on the basis, um, by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And once again, this one was made priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You're a priest forever. This makes Jesus not the word, Jesus, the guarantor of a better covenant. As the word in the ontological trinity, he cannot be a guarantor of a covenant. He cannot be the, the, um, the covenant sacrifice to establish the covenant. He cannot be the mediator of the covenant. Um, he must be a man to be these things. Going on, uh, in chapter 7, 24 to 28, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. But he's a priest, therefore a man, and he continues forever as a man. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives. As the word that would be a given. That would be the assumption. But as a human, that is not the assumption. Humans die. Jesus died. Jesus rose again. Jesus ascended to the Father. 
but he always lives to make intercession for them, for it was indeed fitting that he, we should have such a high priest. But I can't have a high priest who's not a human. The only high priest I can have is a human. But this human is holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints the son. Notice, it is not the word who is appointed, it is the son. That is to say, the person who is the word became the son in incarnation, and he remains the son who has been made perfect, and here again, I would suggest the term ordained forever. Um, he has been ordained forever. He has an everlasting priesthood. In chapter 8, verse 4, now if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. Uh, when Hebrews was written, apparently the temple was still standing. It would have been a perfect argument for Hebrews to say to its readership, you can't go back to the law because the only way the law can be fulfilled is if you have a priesthood that's functioning and you can sacrifice. But the temple has been destroyed. The priesthood has been destroyed. There is no one left. You can't go back. But Hebrews doesn't say that. It, it talks about a priesthood that appears still to be functioning and making sacrifices in Jerusalem. So, uh, if he would be on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. Now, why is all this important? And we're going to, we're going to get through this material fairly quickly this morning, so perhaps it's a good point, a good time in our discussion to stop and ask, do you have any questions about these matters that we're addressing about the continuing humanity of Jesus? If so, this is a good time to ask them. Ah, question one. <laughs> Can we pray to the Lord Jesus directly or should we pray to God the Father through Jesus? Yes, <laughs> uh, we, may, we may do whatever we please, though the biblical pattern is praying to the Father through the name of Jesus on the, uh, uh, by the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let me, let me illustrate this point from the Old Testament. It puzzled me for a long time. Why does Solomon, in the dedication of, of the temple in 1 Kings 8, why does he continually say, if they will pray toward this house, what, what is the point of that? And I, I think I finally understand that idea. It took me several years, not of continual thinking, but just puzzling over it. What, what's going on? And, and one day uh, I had an insight, which one man defined as a sudden flash of the, in, of the obvious. I had an insight that praying toward the temple is praying on the basis of the covenant that the temple administrates ad administers. Um, again, from Hebrews chapter seven, uh, and, and specifically, if you turn to Hebrews seven, verse 11, um, we read this just a minute ago, and I want to read it slightly in a slightly different form as we do it just now. If or if perfection, here the word perfection perhaps means um, fulfillment of the promises, fulfillment of the blessing. If fulfillment came through the, the Levitical priesthood, for the text I read a while ago said under, uh, under it, um, I would argue here we should translate for on Upon it, the people received the law. That is, the law is the foundation of, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the priesthood 
is the foundation of the, of the law. You can't have the law without the priesthood. And notice what, what follows in verse 12 in Hebrews 7. When there is a change of the priesthood, there is of necessity also a change of the law. So if, if I build a house on a foundation and destroy the foundation, the house must, must fall. And that's, that's the point in Hebrews, as far as I understand it, in Hebrews 7, 11, and 12. That is, that the, uh, the priesthood is the foundation of the law. If you take away the priesthood, you take away the law. So the, the whole point is praying toward the temple, is praying toward the ministry that goes on at the temple in 1 Kings 8. The ministry that goes on in the temple is the daily burnt offering, morning and evening. And on the Sabbath, there's a daily Sabbath, there's a daily burnt offering morning and evening, but there's also the Sabbath morning and evening burnt offering. And if the Sabbath happens also to be the day of Passover, there is the Passover morning and evening sacrifice, burnt offering, the, the Sabbath um, uh, morning, morning and evening burnt offering, and the daily morning and evening burnt offering, I calculated as, as bad as my, my math skills are, you will forgive, perhaps you will have better math skills than I. I trust most of you do, uh, but uh, my math skills are, are abysmal. <laughs> I can add, subtract, multiply, and divide, but if it gets very complicated, I'm 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 leaving this. I'm leaving the room, boy. I'm not going to be talking to you about it. But the, but I tried uh, several years ago to go through the Bible and find out all of the required national sacrifices, and if the sac if the uh, temple had had existed for the entire period from. 1406 BC, I'm, I'm including the tabernacle now, from 1406 BC uh, until 70 AD, if it had continued that whole period, and, and if, and both of these huge ifs, if Israel had been faithful in making all the sacrifices, how many sacrifices would have been offered? And it turned out that it would be well over a million sacrifices would have been offered. Um, if, if my math was right, and that's always suspect. Uh, you just count on that. When Allman starts talking about math, you should raise questions about it. So, so uh, uh, I think I'm close to right, but I, but I would be open to any correction that, that anyone could come up with. You would be far more right, ac accurate than I, but a million sacrifices every day every morning, every evening, sacrifices being made. Um, you're praying toward, first, first Kings 8, you're praying toward the temple because even if you are in a distant land, and that's what First Kings 8 talks about. It's not talking specifically about, about exile. It's talking specifically about um, anyone who's traveling in a foreign land if you're traveling in a foreign land and you can't make sacrifice because you can't get to the temple, nonetheless, you may know that God will hear your prayers because the daily burnt offering, morning and evening, is being made for you. And you can, you can trust to the foundation remaining for your experience of, the, of, of life as an Israelite. By the same token, Jesus is the guarantor, the sacrifice, and the mediator of the new covenant. He is the sacrifice of the new covenant because uh, chapter 7 of Hebrews says all sacrifice, all covenants are, are based on, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, the translations read differently at the end of chapter 7, uh, based on dead bodies. It's, it's based on the death of the testator. Well, Jesus is both the testator uh, and the mediator of the covenant. So he's the guarantor of the covenant. He is the one who, if I default in the covenant, he will make it up. Um, do you have in your legal system a co-signer 
for loans. Okay. okay. Yeah. I see heads nodding. Yes. Um, uh, if you co-sign on a loan in the primary uh, a borrower defaults, you are uh, accountable for the loan. And that's Jesus. He is the guarantor. But he has already paid the default by dying. He is the sacrifice of the new covenant. So always um, covenants are made upon sacrifice, uh, upon the bodies of sacrificed victims. Jesus is the victim who is sacrificed to establish the new covenant. And he is the mediator of the new covenant. So as we shall see a little bit later, he is the one who is interceding for us um, at, at the right hand of God as, as we go through our lives. So with this reality about Jesus, um, and, and going back to our PowerPoint, uh, with this reality about Jesus, I, I don't want to go back to the PowerPoint yet. I've forgotten. I've still got some questions to answer. But the answer is, I may pray to Jesus. That's not the pattern of Scripture. I don't know of any more than one prayer in the New Testament, Stephen's prayer, uh, uh, receive my, my spirit, Lord Jesus, um, where anybody prayed to Jesus directly. But that doesn't mean we can't do it. Set question two, Colossians 2, 9, for in him the whole, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Is this verse talking about the Lord Jesus in his present state in heaven? Or is this talking about the fullness of the deity dwelling in the Lord Jesus when he was on earth before his death, resurrection, and ascension? Again, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, uh, in the incarnation, in the days of his flesh on earth, um, the fullness of bodily dwelt. So that Jesus can say in the upper room discourse, how can you say, show us the Father? He who has seen me has seen the Father. You have seen all the characteristics of the Father in Jesus. Um, so the fullness of, body, of, of deity dwelt in him bodily when he was on earth. The fullness of, of, of deity dwells bodily in him now in heaven. But now uh, he has not restricted the revelation of his deity to what can be revealed through the human body. I see one who is both man and God, and I, I am confronted by this astonishing being. Um, um, so the answer is both. And request, as a sequel to the classes on Christology, could you take in-depth classes on the book of Isaiah? No, <laughs> I just finished a series on Isaiah in, in uh, Dallas. Uh, the, the, the last Sunday I was in with my, my uh, adult class in Dallas on, uh, in uh, December, we finished Isaiah 66 and there were 80 some sessions. No, I can't do it in that study. <laughs> you don't have 80 sessions that you want to spend with me on Isaiah. Uh, so no, that's not gonna be an option. <laughs> Uh, I, I would love to spend some time with Isaiah, but, but that's uh, beyond the capacity right now, unless uh, there is a, a, uh, an undying hue and cry, a, a great outpouring of, of uh, a consensus in India. We want to spend two years in Isaiah with Allman every week. Right? So, so uh, uh, that's, that's good. I am just trying to make sense of the whole conversation. Do we then say Jesus... Uh, we exercise his, his infinite uh, spiritual, uh, supernatural powers only when he wanted to while he was on earth. He, he determined not to. Um, um, when I, we dealt with this, I think it was last week, uh, Matthew chapter 12, let's turn back there. I want you to see this. Uh, and I want you to see it in the context. In Matthew 12, I have it marked in another Bible. Um, 
better. Uh, but in, in Matthew 12, uh, verse 38, then some of the scribes and the Pharisees uh, responded, teacher, uh, let's see, what, Matthew 12, I am in the right place. Oh, dear me, Matthew 12, I'm in the right ch chapter. Where is the unpardonable sin? Ah, um, oh, there, verse uh, uh, 24. In fact, let's start with verse 22. Then a man afflicted by a, a demon was brought to him. The man was blind and deaf. And he healed him so that the, the deaf mute man spoke and saw. And all were astonished. All the crowds were astonished. And they began to say, this couldn't be the son of David, could it? Verse 24, the Pharisees, when they heard, said, this one does not cast out demons except by the power of Beelzebul, the prince of demons. Um, it's here that Jesus begins the, what we call the discourse on the unpardonable sin. So verse 25, knowing their thoughts. How did he know their thoughts? Is he practicing his, his uh, knowledge of their, of their thoughts because he is omniscient? Can a human mind be omniscient? And the answer is no, it cannot. A human mind is like any receptacle. I have here a cup. Um, Brother Timothy, it's a Dallas Seminary cup. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm kosher here, brother. But um, this can hold only so much tea. Uh, it can't hold all the tea I might wish to put in it. Um, and it's like my mind. We have not even tested the limits of the human mind. Uh, we, we, both the effects of sin and the effects of, uh, well, primarily the effects of sin, have, have kept us from being able to tap all of the potentiality of the human mind. We simply have not tested the limits of the human mind, but it remains finite. The effect of that is that Jesus is not tainted by sin, so he can, he can use his mind better than you and I are able to. We are subject to false presuppositions. He is not. We have unsound worldviews. He did not. Um, none of these things trap him so that he is unable to think soundly as a human. But we read in John 5 and we read in John 7 some days ago that the Son cannot do anything except what he sees the Father do. Um, the, the point there, and, and, and I know John 2, um, he knew all men, he knew what was in the heart of men. That is to say, not that he was omniscient as a man, but he knows human flesh. And so... He knows believers uh, who are there and at the end of John 2, but he can only, as a human, he can only, living as a human, commit himself to a group of 12. And that's why he has 12 disciples. Sociologically, you can only be intimate with about 12 other people. That means the, the optimal size of a small group is 13. When I first heard that, I kind of slapped myself in the forehead as we Americans do. Yeah, of course. I wonder if Jesus knew that when he was here, <laughs> that God created humans to be able to be intimate with 12 people. So he gave himself to those who, who he knew the Father had chosen and, and let, the, let, let his Father and the Spirit deal with the rest who were believers. That statement at the end of John 2 is not a statement that those people were false believers. It's a statement that 
in his in his capacity as a leader, as a human leader, he must keep on task. He must keep his mission before him, and his mission is to prepare these men for their ministry subsequent to his departure. Um, so in John five, the son cannot do, and he doesn't even know anything that the father doesn't reveal to him. So when he knows their thoughts, it's that the father has revealed these things to him. Um, he, he, he's acting as a true human would, and as a true human would, a human unfallen, untainted by sin, would always live by faith in God, actuated, guided, functioning, doing the things that God wills for us to do. And so he's living entirely as a human being. This is not the case now. Now he is functioning uh, and revealing himself both in his human form and in his divine form. So let me make sure I've answered the question. Jesus exercised his infinite supernatural powers only when he wanted to. No, only when the Father willed it. And but but for the most part, Jesus didn't do the miracles by his own power. We came to the unpardonable sin passage for a purpose, and that purpose is to say, it is clear and obvious to everyone who saw Jesus that he was a man. What was not clear and obvious is that he was God. But turn to John 3 now and see uh, the the godly side of a Pharisee response to Jesus. I'm, I'm assuming that Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Um, so in John 3, Nicodemus, yeah, he's a Pharisee. The text says, uh, verse 1, there was a man up from the Pharisees, Nicodemus by name, a ruler of the Jews. This one came to him at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know, again, I want to ask the question that we asked a, a few weeks ago, who is the we, if it's not the Pharisees? We know that you are a teacher sent from God, for no one can do these signs that you are doing if God is not with him. What was most obvious about Jesus watching him is that he was a man, and second, that the power at work in him is the power of God. So in Matthew 12, to say that the power behind Jesus is Satan is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's unpardonable. That cannot be excused in this age or in the age which is coming. What can be excused is to make the mistake that Jesus was in the incarnation, was merely a man. That was what he looked like. That's what he acted like. It was, it was what even his, his mother concluded. Turn to Luke chapter 1, a fascinating passage. I just, I dearly love this passage. It's so, um, it's so telling about the nature of Jesus. In Luke 1, um, oh, let's see, 2, Luke 2. Um, Oh, uh, gracious. Verse, uh, boy, they. Okay, somebody help me. Where is Jesus uh, talking to his mother at, in the temple when, when, his, his, uh, when Mary and Joseph left and had to come back to Jerusalem? I, I can't find it quickly. Somebody help me out with this. Uh, Luke 2.49. Yes, I was, I was close. Um, yeah. So Jesus stays and uh, verse uh, 48. Seeing him, they were, they were uh, perplexed. And his mother said to him, child, why have you acted like this toward us. Behold, your father and I have been in grief seeking for you. 
I've read that word for word. That's, that's likely what your English text will say. But that's good American English. I don't know. I, I, I wish I knew your languages. I, it just, I feel so handicapped not knowing your languages. Um, but in, in Greek or Hebrew, you never say your father and I. Uh, first person first, second person second, third person third. So I and your father is the right way to say it. Every place else you find that kind of statement where I and someone else are listed together as the subject or the object. Um, I comes first, third person comes second. So she should have said by proper etiquette, by proper, by proper Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, I and your father have been seeking you. So she's put things out of order. What has she said? Your father and I have been seeking you. Why does she say that? Well, she, she nursed him. She taught him to walk. She taught him to eat properly. She taught him his, 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 uh, his language skills. She taught him uh, how to take responsibility in the family. He was a true human child and still had to be taught all these things. It's hard for her to remember who Jesus is. How do you keep in mind that this baby you have carried since the womb is the Son of God? How do you keep that in mind? He is a baby like every other baby. He's not like every other baby because he learns more quickly. He's not like every other baby because he has no sin. He's not like every other baby because he's not completely self-centered. But he's like every other baby in every other way. How do you keep in mind who this child really is? And the answer is you really can't. It's, it's beyond keeping that in mind. You raise this child for 12 years. Joseph taught him his trade, probably a stone cutter. We always call him a carpenter, but he's, he's a stone cutter. There, there was no forest in the area of Galilee where they could be doing carpentry. So stone cutting is more likely. He's probably a mason of some sort, or perhaps just a handyman able to do any, any kind of trade. So, so Joseph taught him to handle tools, taught him, no, don't, you don't hold it this way, you hold it that way. Um, how do you keep that in mind? But look at Jesus' response. In verse 49, he said to them, why is it that you were seeking me? And I'm going to preserve the, the Greek word order here so that we don't lose the, the point. Jesus emphasizes something here that our English translation may miss. So, did you not know that at my father's, or I must be? See, in English, I must say, did you not know that I must be at my father's? He doesn't say in my father's house. He said, he says something like at my father's, I must be. Why were you looking for him? Where, where would I go but home? <laughs> so he is correcting her about who, who, who his father is. She can't see him as other than a true human, remarkably human, but true human child. Why? Because that's the way he lived his whole life. He lived his life as a true human being. Upon the ascension, he has rid himself of the necessity of limiting his revelation of his, of his divine nature. And now he reveals himself uh, fully as both God and man. Um, All right, um, I don't have much more to do tonight, today, so tonight, <laughs> so we are, we are on track to actually finish. So let's go back to PowerPoint and move on now. Why is all this important? Our sin merits an infinite penalty. Um, 
and, and I'll explain why. There's a basic principle. As the dignity of the entity wronged increased, the severity of the penalty for the wrong increases. If I betray you, um, you will be very angry at me and you will, you will want a, a genuine repentant response or you will want some appropriate penalty to fall upon me if I don't, if I'm not repentant about it. But if I, re, if I betray the state in war, I'm a soldier and I'm in battle and I turn traitor, <clears throat> that's a death penalty. Uh, the dignity of the entity wrong has increased. You're a, you're a friend, you're a brother in Christ, you're a sister in Christ. As such, for me to betray you is a horrible breach of our relationship. And only genuine repentance can deal with that. But, but treason against the state, especially in war, mandates the death of the traitor. So as the dignity of the entity wronged increases, should be increases, the severity of the penalty for the wrong increases. In our sin, the entity wronged is God. Psalm 51, 4, against you and you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Psalm 51 is a psalm written with reference to David's experience with Bathsheba and murder of Uriah. That's stipulated in the, in the heading, the first two verses of the psalm in Hebrew. Later in the psalm, <clears throat> he does not confess adultery. He confesses murder so that we are intended to think both of the, of the adultery and the murder. I asked myself, Many years ago, is this really true against you and you alone? Have I sinned and done what's evil in your sight? Did he not sin against Bathsheba? Did he not sin also against um, Uriah? And I, I got to do some study on this and found, yes, you can sin against a human being. But this verse remains true not in the sense that all sin um, is against God because some sin is against another human being, but because sin to be sin must be seen as against its ultimate offended party, namely God. So David forced himself upon on Bathsheba. Uh, how do you know that, Oman? The text doesn't say that. And the answer I give is very simple. Um, Uriah is away at, at the battlefront. Bathsheba, Bathsheba is at home with no male protector. So who is her protector? Should be David, the king. That's one of his roles, is to protect the rights of the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the alien. You will say, but she is not a widow. Uh, in point of law, she's not a widow. But in point of fact, there is no one to protect her. She needs a male to protect her. David is the one who is protecting her because he's the king. But David uses her. And a further part of the argument is no blame is ever attributed to Bathsheba. In fact, Bathsheba is ultimately rewarded in that situation, for though her son died in penalty for David's sin, her son also became the next king. So she is rewarded in this circumstance, and therefore I conclude that before God, she is blameless in the circumstance. David, either by force of, of his physical power, or by force of his presence, or by force of his position, um, 
imposed himself upon her and she had no choices except to uh, give in. David also murdered Uriah. <sighs> Uriah is not merely one of, the, one of the chief warriors in David's army. Uriah is a convert to the worship of Yahweh. His name, Uri Yahu, means Yahweh is my light. Uh, but he's a Hittite. He's a Canaanite whose primary sin is violation of loyalty to the family. But Uriah is loyal to Israel and loyal to the Lord because he's out fighting the wars of the Lord. Instead, David, who should be out fighting the wars of the Lord, that's what his commission was. Instead of being out fighting the wars of the Lord, he's home taking it easy in the period of the year when kings go out to battle. He's, he's forgotten that he is not really king. He's just the servant of the king. God is the true king. He is God's servant. And so he's doing the king's, taking the king's role and not the servant's role. And so he, the, the Canaanite practices loyalty to God where the Israelite Messiah violates his position, his own position, and then murders one who is a, an alien, who is a convert to the worship of the Lord. So in both cases, David has, has violated Bathsheba and Uriah, but in both cases, more importantly, God, David has violated his relationship with God. So he, it, it's a matter of definition to wrong a human may, in fact, not be sinful. God's judgment against sinful humans is wronging, and that word in quotation marks is significant. Uh, God is wronging, he's bringing affliction on sinful humans, but it's not sinful. Sin is sin because it is against God. I, I never told my children, you see, you disobeyed daddy, that means you're a sinner. That's not true. They're sinners. That's why they disobeyed daddy. They didn't disobey daddy as a definition of sin. Their sin led them to disobey daddy. Sin is sin because it's not against me. It's because it's against God. Um, and we have, we have argued before that the essential element of sin is unbelief. So, so we're not acting in faith when we sin. That entails then that we have wronged God. We have counted God as not trustworthy. That's why it merits an infinite penalty. Therefore, only man should die atoning for man's sin, but man cannot die. We don't have the resources to pay the penalty. I can't pay an infinite penalty. I can pay a penalty for myself, but I can never pay the infinite penalty off. It's infinite. It has no boundaries. It has no termination point. It must last forever. So I don't have the resources. You don't have the resources. All humanity doesn't have the resources to pay the, the penalty for one human sin, much less all the sins that each of us commits. So Psalm 49, 7 to 9, no man can in any way uh, redeem his brother. The redemption of a soul, the atonement for a soul is endless. It would cease, cease being offered so that he may live forever and not die. That's a very important set of verses there in 49, 79. You ought to go study that. But Jesus is God who cannot die. Only God has the resources to pay the penalty, but God cannot pay for he is, he, he is eternal life. He doesn't have eternal life. He is eternal life. So only a God-man can redeem us from our penalty, sin penalty. So I must have the God-man provided to us in the wisdom of God. If he... 
If he does not still possess true human nature, though, he would not be our mediator. Job 16.21, very important verse. Job, in his trouble, in all of his sufferings, longed for one thing before God. I'm not even, uh, well, yeah, yeah, I can say that. I, I, I pondered, is that really a legitimate answer or a legitimate statement? I think it is. He longed for one thing before God, that God would at least hear his, uh, his case against God. I, I've got evidence, Lord. If you would listen to me, I would give it to you, and you would see that you're afflicting a man improperly. So, but, but, but he can't find God, and God won't listen to him. There are reasons for that, and we would, we would do well at some point to talk about these things, but right now is not the time. The, uh, uh, but, but one thing that he wants, since God won't listen, he wants a mediator. So verse 21, um, um, well, that's not what I'm looking for. Job 16, 21. Oh, that there were a daysman between us who would put his hand on each of us. That, that, I don't have that right verse here. Um, uh, let's see, perhaps, um, well, yeah, it, it, is, it is all right for the present. Let's look at it. My friends scorn me. My eye pours out tears to God that he would argue the case of a man with God as a son of man does with his neighbor. But I go on to some succeeding uh, references, Job 9.33, for he is not a man as I am that I might answer him, that we should come together uh, uh, for trial. There is no arbiter between us who might, who might lay his hand on us both. Who could lay his hand on Job without destroying him? Only a man could do that. Who could lay his hand on God so that he would listen to Job? Only someone who has, has unique access to God could do that. But God isn't going to subject himself to such things. The, the problem that we have in this verse is that the arbiter must be someone who is in some sense equal to both of the parties that he is arbitrating for. But who can be equal to man and to God? If, God is, if Jesus is a mediator, who must he be? Romans 8, 31 to 34. What, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, um, the text from which I, I, I copied this reads, who can be against us. In fact, in Hebrew, in Greek, there is no verb there in that question. And that means I normally should supply the verb either from the context or I will supply the verb to be there. So let me read it that way. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Is there anyone who can bring a charge? You will ask this shortly here. You know this passage. Is there anyone who can bring a charge and get a hearing in the court? Well, who is the judge? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. So I do have an arbiter. I do have one who is equal to man, who is equal to God. I have one who can lay his hand on each of us. And he can bring us together. And he can, he can plead the case, yes, this man has sinned. Yes, this woman has sinned. But I have paid the penalty. All of the wrath that is rightly theirs has fallen on me. Therefore, 
We cannot, you cannot condemn such people. These people stand before you with me as their arbiter. And with me, the mediator can turn and say, my dear child, you are forgiven. And as I read this passage, I go back to verse 32. My father did not spare anything for you. He gave his own son for you. He will now give you all, in, in me, all graciously, all things. And there is no charge that can be laid against you because it is God who justifies. God has declared you righteous in the court. Satan's charges are out of order. They are contempt of court because there is no double indemnity with God. Either the penalty must be paid by the sinner or it must be paid by the arbiter, by the mediator, by the covenant sacrifice, by the guarantor. And the guarantor has paid the penalty. There is no double indemnity before God. So in the court of divine justice, we stand not only acquitted. Um, some of our translations read acquit for justify. Should not be ever read acquit. There is no such thing as acquittal in uh, Hebrew law. You either justify the righteous or you condemn the wicked. You, you declare that the righteous is righteous or you, you declare that the wicked is under, just, uh, under judgment uh, and liable to penalty. So there is no category of innocence in Hebrew law, as far as I can tell. Uh, the word innocent in English, it, it, it's, it's a technical legal term. It comes out of Latin. Nokeo is the basic word that means to be wrong or to be hurt, hurtful. And the in prefix negates it. So, uh, so when I declare a defendant in court innocent, all I am declaring is that this person has no fault with reference to the charges brought before the court. We're not commenting on that person in any other affair of his life. We're not, com we're com not commenting on that person in, res in respect of his personal character. We are simply saying, as far as the charges are concerned, there is no fault in this person. God either declares guilty or righteous. And so we are not declared innocent before God. We are declared righteous before God. For we are declared righteous, for we stand in the righteous one. 1 Timothy 2.5, we come back to that verse that we started with. For there is one God. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. If he is a mediator, he must be equal to man and to God. But if he gave up his humanity, if he never was truly human, then he cannot be a mediator because he cannot understand the human condition of weakness. He knows that we are weak, but he doesn't realize how weak we are for having never experienced the true weakness, both of the human um, arm and of the human spirit. But he did experience both the weakness of the human arm and the human spirit. And in that weakness, surely I must read again Hebrews chapter 5, with strong cryings and tears, he, he uh, pleaded with God for deliverance from death, and he was heard because of his godliness. So this, this material that we are discussing is not extraneous. It is not just, in my opinion, or from my point of view, not just good theology. I, I think it is good theology, but that's not the point. I need to know the resources God has granted to me and to you and to all of our brothers and sisters worldwide. I need to know where I stand before God. Do I have any ground, any standing with him in order to be able to approach him, to think that he might use me. We all know that he uses us by grace. We all know that he forgives our sin. 
But is it like a human forgiveness? Um, I heard a fellow, I, I read a fellow say one time about forgiveness. It's not really true to say we must forgive and forget because some violations of relationship are so deep that they can't, you can't simply forget them. You can't, can't go back to the relationship that you had before the violation occurred. But when you forgive, you can give the other person the opportunity first to live without being beaten up by the offense every time you talk to them. And second, to live in the hope of rebuilding now, perhaps not the same relationship, but a better one, perhaps a better one than you had before the violation occurred. But you see, that's not the way God forgives. God forgives by completely paying the penalty for your sin. An infinite person faced the wrath of God. I don't know what I'm even saying here. I'm saying things that I have no real understanding, and I don't think I have perhaps ever will have a perspective from which we can understand. I think maybe at the judgment seat of Christ, we'll begin to understand as God brings before the court all of our behavior, all of our sin and all of our righteousness so that Jesus will be glorified in every way. And if my hope is in Jesus being glorified, I will not be ashamed because Jesus is shown to be the cause of my status before him, then, then I may begin as I hear the judgment that was just for my sin and the judgment and your sin, and it's revealed, and all of your sins, and all of the sins of each of you, and all of our other brothers and sisters since the beginning of humanity. Uh, I hear all of this, and I begin to see the grandeur <coughs> And the horror of the, of the debt Jesus paid, I may begin to sense a little bit of what the grace of God is in forgiving us our sins <coughs> and, and making us children. He is not ashamed to call us brothers. Jesus is not. I finally may begin to understand. But I have the daysman. I have the arbiter who can lay his hand on both God and me. He can lay his hand on me without destroying me before he remains a man. And he can lay his hand on God the Father without himself being destroyed, for he is God. He is their arbiter. He is our mediator. He is the guarantor of the new covenant. His sacrifice is the sacrifice for the new covenant. It's a better sacrifice than the sacrifices of Abraham and making the Abrahamic covenants. Better sacrifice than the sacrifices Moses offered in Exodus 24 in making the Mosaic covenant. It's a better sacrifice than any sacrifice we've ever known. It's a complete sacrifice, unrepeatable, because it's not necessary to repeat it. There's one sacrifice for, for all sin, for all time. And Jesus, the one who is the Word, the one who became the Son, the one whom we now know by the name of Jesus is our arbiter. He is our mediator. He stands between us and God and brings us to the Father, not trembling in terror, but trembling with joy at the delight in our Father's eyes as he sees us coming home. Well, we have 20 minutes to the end of, or so to the end of our conference. Are there any more questions? Brother? Yes. At one time, we, we were told that the, uh, the impeccability of Jesus 
it covered both his humanity and divinity and even as a human he did not have the capacity to sin commit a sin so what do you say about this i would disagree with that let me let me take us back to our powerpoint yeah go back please. a few uh, a few screens uh oy vey <laughs> The computer tells it what to do. It does what I tell it to do instead of what I want it to do. This is most dis disconcerting. Uh, let's see, how far back shall I take us here? Hope I'm not wasting your time. No, you're not wasting my time in the least. My time is your time, brother. Mm -hmm. um, um, okay, here's the slide that I want. Uh, the, the redeemer of man must not be weakly and peccably human because peccably means able to sin uh, because he must be mighty to save, traveling in the greatness of his strength. Three distinctions are important here. And this is going to be making a distinction in English, which may not be absolutely clear to you in uh, as uh, those who, while you have spoken English most of your lives, uh, may not have spoken English quite like this. Number one, God is not able to sin. In Latin, non posse peccare. The, the, the word order is critical here. He is not able to sin. At his creation, Adam was able not to sin. Posse non peccare in Latin. And you'll see the word known has shifted its position here. This word means to be able not to sin. So Adam was able not to sin at his creation. Satan is not able not to sin. Non posse, non picard. So Satan is not able not to sin. What shall I say of Jesus? Jesus has the same humanity that Adam had before the fall. Um, he has the necessity of living by faith. He has the necessity to live, to live according to the commandments of God. <clears throat> and he is able to do that. But he is also able to sin. And I would add that Jesus in the incarnation is as a human, the human nature. Let's go back even farther Let's see, where did we deal with the two natures of Jesus again here? Since he has, he is acting in his human nature during the, the, the uh, incarnation, he is changeable. He is open to change. We know that because he grew physically. We know it also because he grew, grew intellectually. But he is changeable, potentially, as a human. His human nature is changeable in reference to holiness and goodness. So his human nature is able to sin. One of the values of reading uh, Shed, uh, now let me go back then to that prior uh, slide. One of the values of reading William G.T. Shedd's dogmatic theology is that he gives us quite a good treatment of the Trinity and of the, the union of the two natures of, uh, of Jesus in his person, how this all works out. So, so as God, the word is not able to sin. As man, the son is able to sin but he's also able not to sin. I don't know whether, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a reference to a, um, to a uh, piece of classical Greek literature that you may or may not know. It's called the Odyssey by Homer. Is that, is, is the story of the Odyssey at all known in India? Probably not, not widely. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a, a fellow Odysseus is the, 
is the hero of the story. It's a long poem um, in ancient Greek. It's one of the earliest pieces of ancient Greek writing that we have. Odysseus is on an odyssey. <laughs> That's where we get the word odyssey. <laughs> Odysseus is on an odyssey, 20 years trying to get home from Troy. They've been in battle uh, at Troy for 10 years. I think it's a, a 10 year journey uh, to get home to his family. And one of the gods hates him. And so they chase him all over the Mediterranean trying to destroy him and, and other gods are protecting him right through, this, through the whole thing. In the process, he is on the uh, coast, he is on the coast of Sicily and there is a, there are two rocks that he has to sail between because of the course that is set for him by the winds, Scylla and Charybdis. I'm sorry, I, I got the wrong story, wrong part of the story. It's in that same portion of the story though. He must go by this, the island of the Sirens, S-I-R-E-N-S. -E the Sirens are semi-divine creatures, female, who have such gorgeous voices and they sing. They, their, their voices are just enchanting. In the, in, the, um, in the magical sense of the word enchanting, they, they entrance, they put sailors in a trance and, and, uh, um, and lure them to jump into the sea and swim to the island, but, but they can never get there for they always drown as they swim toward the island of the, uh, of the mm -hmm. sirens. Odysseus doesn't want to lose any of his men. He, he's, he's faithful. His men are faithful to him. He's faithful to them. And so he, he has beeswax put into their ears and he chains them to the oars. But before they do that, they, uh, they lash him. He wants to hear the siren song because it's so beautiful. He, he, he wants to hear it, but he doesn't want to die either. And so he has them lash him with ropes to the mast of the boat. Uh, and uh, he, he makes them swear, no matter how I plead with you, um, don't let me loose. This is a, an illustration, I think, of the, of the humanity of Christ wedded to the deity of Christ. His humanity is able to sin, but it's also able not to sin. But it's the power of God that keeps him from sinning so that, so that like the mast and the lashing of Odysseus to the mast, uh, Odysseus is not able to get free and no one will set him free. So he has, he has susceptibility to the siren song, but he is not able to get there. Uh, and so uh, the, he is both able not to sin and not able to sin. Um, when uh, 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 I feel it is, oh, we, we just said that. Um, I have answered questions one and two already. So I, so, oh, oh, yes, uh, Brother Tim uh, mentioned that. So are there other questions? Hmm. Dr. Jim, uh, I have yeah. one question. All right. Uh, what is the implication that he was not born of uh, a human uh, father, that he was born of the Holy Spirit? Uh, I don't know altogether. <laughs> I'm not sure. Specifically, a, a very traditional um, view that I've been, I've, I've heard and you have is that you get your sin, sin nature from your father. First of all, I, I dispute the concept of sin nature. Uh, I think it says too much um, and doesn't give us enough useful information. There's no biblical reason why I have to talk about sin nature. So uh, flesh, he certainly had flesh and that he got from his mother. Um, I, I don't know altogether. Um, I have puzzled brother over that. And I've asked also the question, well, then how is he descended from David? And, and again, the answer people usually give is, well, Matthew gives the royal line and um, 
Uh, Luke gives the human line through Mary, but the text doesn't say that. Uh, it's, it's in Luke, it uh, traces him through Joseph, not through Mary. So it appears that we get Joseph's genealogy in both cases. Okay, then how does he get, um, how is he a descendant of David if that happens? And folks, the one thing I can always say about this, it sounds in some measure like I'm trying to um, be flippant with the question, but God can do anything he wants to. And more importantly, if, if it's necessary, God can create David's DNA uh, in Jesus without, without um, uh, Joseph's interference on that. But I, I really don't know, uh, perhaps others have thought about this more, more deeply than I have. No doubt others have thought more deeply about this, but I don't have any biblical ground to which I can turn to say, well, this is the answer. So I apologize. All I can do is give you questions and not answers. <laughs> well, with only a few minutes left, let me say to you uh, how much I value the time that, that you have allowed me to share with you. And I pray God's blessing on you. Um, we're, pr we're praying for your health and for your preservation. Not so much that you may be comfortable, but that you may be comforting, uh, that you may be uh, people whom God will use not only in these days of COVID, but in years to come, that God will give you fruitful ministries and that we will be all astonished when we stand before the Lord. I think about my puny efforts in teaching over these last years. And I think, what, what fruit will God ever bring from this? Um, and yet I get, God gives me the privilege of hearing just little, little bits and pieces. And I'm not asking for any praise here. I don't want it, frankly. I can't use it. I can't value it. Um, let the praise come from God. Um, the, but when I hear little bits and pieces, I think, oh my, God did that. Thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. and, and I hear from students that I had um, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, 38 years ago, and what God is doing through them. And I think I had just a tiny piece in their lives. And I'm so grateful that God gave me the privilege of knowing something of what he's been doing in their lives over the years. Um, met with a fellow last Friday, had lunch with him. He was in a German class I taught <laughs> at, a, uh, at a, a seminary here in Memphis. And, and uh, he said, you, you helped me get through my doctorate. And this guy has been on a seminary faculty for all these years since and has been a pastor for many years. And I had just a tiny bit, but, but God does, does great things with small, with small resources. So I thank you. I thank God for you. And I pray that God will give you such fruitfulness in ministry that all we can say when we stand before God is all we can do is weep for joy at the greatness of his grace as he has showered it on us. Uh, and I will continue to pray for Indiana for the uh, for the COVID scourge that is afflicting the people.